Voldemort took place 90 years ago. We're commemorating the 90th year anniversary. And the war is um, a, almost a two year event now. And what's the connection between the two? Um, well, there's no direct connection, of course, but there is a connection in the sense of um, the uh, long term history of um, Ukraine within the Soviet Union and more recently in its relations with Russia um, as an as an independent state. Um, I, if we um, if we look at the whole of the more as a genocide, and we can we can we can look at this event as um, or as a as part of a longer process of genocide. Um, we um, uh, you mentioned the uh, destruction of elites and of uh, church leaders and of um, um, deportations and killings. And these all took place, um, um, much of this took place in the 1930s. And that's why um, we um, uh, look at the Holdemore as the most um, uh, obvious and the most uh, uh, terrible, I think, of, um, of these events, the event that stands out uh, the most. But um, this was not the only um, um, use of mass violence against Ukrainians by the uh, Soviet uh, regime. And when I say Soviet regime, this was a, uh, a state that was based in Moscow and that was um, associated very, very closely um, with the Russian state and with the Russian imperial tradition. So um, we sometimes um, look at the Holdemar is sometimes explained as um, an outcome of communism, per se. But uh, but but you know um, this is too simple an explanation. One has to look at the long term history, and I think if we look at what Lemkin, uh, Raphael Lemkin, said about uh, the whole of the uh, and about uh, genocide in Ukraine in particular, um, he. Um, outlined that uh, um, that there were four um, prongs or four four events or four or, or or better still four processes that stood out in his in his um, um, analysis. One was the famine uh, that was um, uh, aimed at destroying Ukraine's um, farmers. Uh, one was the attack against the the uh, the uh, intellectuals, and um, he, uh, Lemkin described this as um, um, an attack against the nation's brains. Um, the um, intellectual elites, uh, um, um, and then another um, attack was aimed against uh, the Ukrainian church. So um, the the um, against the soul or the spirit of Ukraine, and uh, then he also mentioned that in the long term uh, there was a question of resettlement and deportations. Uh, so through the course of Soviet history, um, we see that uh, all of these uh, processes of eliminating, of subjugating, of, uh, of destroying uh, Ukraine and Ukrainians and their culture um, took place over a period of many decades. And during World War II, we have um, also the mass killings of um, uh, prisoners um, in Western Ukraine. And we have deportations that took place um, and when we talk about deportations, uh, it was not only against Ukrainians, but um, there were other um, nationalities that uh, were uh, subject to, to genocidal policies in the Soviet Union. So we can look at the genocide as a um, process of uh, the 
unmaking or the uh, deconstruction of the Ukrainian nation, a deconstruction by violence, and the attempt by the Soviet regime to construct a Soviet Russian nation and state on the, on the basic um, ruins of all of these other nations, including the Ukrainians, primarily because we're talking about the Ukrainians first of all here, but also on the others, the Crimean Tatars, the Chechens, um, the English people, um, they all were, all were subject to um, this, um, um, to these processes of uh, destruction. And now in 2022, we see that Russia has returned to a uh, genocidal uh, war against Ukraine because they've stated openly that their aim is to um, um, wipe out the Ukrainian nation per se. In fact, Putin has stated that he doesn't even recognize that a Ukrainian nation exists. So um, uh, I'll, I'll leave my comments of that because I know others um, will want to speak to this as well. Thank you. Yeah. Well, shall I shall I jump in, yeah, both sure, of them? Sure, sure. Yeah, and I, I would just add that none of this could happen if if the state didn't prepare people by uh, ramping up rhetoric that encourages genocide. The Both during the whole of the war and today, we'll talk about the whole of the war first, there was an active campaign to demonize Ukrainians, both as kulaks, peasant farmers. Uh, initially, the aim was the 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 label was aimed at the more successful farmers they were labeled exploiters parasites uh basically they were called a class that deserved to, to be eliminated but in fact the the label could be applied to anyone that was your enemy that you even thought potentially was a threat to the soviet state and it was used to destroy uh, tens of thousands of people and send them to the gulag um and it wasn't just that was not the only label. And I should add, there were uh, it was a campaign that included posters. The the populace was prepared to think of the Ukrainian farmer as the enemy. And when you think about that time time period, correct me if I'm wrong, Bogdan, but it was probably 85 percent of the population of Ukraine were uh, li living in the rural areas in the countryside as farmers. Um, but there was also the label Petlerite, uh, political enemies, uh, Ukrainians that were considered not reliable because um, they were not sufficiently supportive of the establishment of Bol Bolshevik rule. That was another class of people that were enemies of the state. And you can see caricatures in the publications of the time, posters. It would have been in radio programs all kinds of messaging to tell the population that these are your enemies these people are dangerous you're you don't you, you don't have enough because these pe people are exploiting you and uh the true believers um there were those true believers who went into villages and went house to house uh turning everything upside down taking metal rods poking it in the walls searching for hidden grain some of them truly believed that these people were enemies uh deserving to die so it's a it's a process of dehumanization so that the people who carry out the acts of genocide feel justified in, in in doing it that's not to say there aren't all different other categories of perpetrators opportunists and uh sadists uh but there is that portion of the perpetrator group that is uh motivated by uh some true belief and the state primed them with this genocidal rhetoric. And we see it today as well. Uh, I was watching just this morning a video comp compilation uh, put together by a woman named Julia Davis, who, as she says, she monitors Russian TV, so you don't have to. Uh, she, uh, But it, it's really horrifying the range of 
experts, you know, the, the people that they put on Russian TV to talk about how Russia, how Ukrainians need to be destroyed and, and eliminated and how they normalize it in the everyday discourse in, in, in Russia. It's, it's really qu quite horrifying. And I would add that if you look at the full name of the genocide convention that the most of the countries in the world have signed on to, it's the it's the convention for ah what's the full name prevention of genocide is in the name the the country signed on to prevent genocide and with the rhetoric that's coming out of the kremlin today the countries of the world uh it's not just a nice thing or I, it, it would be nice if they helped ukraine defend itself it's actually an obligation that they signed on to when they signed on to this genocide convention because it it, it does uh, uh it does require the signees to prevent genocide and and it's not really a question anymore that there's genocidal intent by the russian government thank you I may. I just wanted to add a few words to both comments. Um, the Soviet Union, Imperial Russia, and the Russian Federation have employed massive violence with regard to a whole host of nationalities, whether those who inhabited Siberia, Ukrainians, Poles, Balts, Belarusians, Crimean Tatars, and many, many others. And in that regard, uh, they act as more or less typical imperial, aggressive imperial powers. That said, what strikes me is the fact that when one looks at the whole span of Russian Muscovite history, uh, there seems to be a special place within that political culture that is reserved for Ukraine and Ukrainians. As much as the Russians may rant and rail against others, they reserve their greatest degree of ranting and railing against Ukrainians. Um, Ukraine has, I mean, there's a distinct and obvious pathology at work here. I can understand hating everybody. Um, I'm not sure I understand why one would hate one particular group consistently, persistently over centuries. Um, and it's, and you know, clearly there's a reason for this. I mean, there's a reason for this pathological political culture, uh, which is very similar, by the way, to German attitudes towards Jews. I mean, we should be very explicit about this. I mean, it wasn't just Nazi propaganda. Uh, there was a whole tradition going back centuries of German animosity towards Jews, indeed, European animosity towards Jews. And that needs to be factored into any explanation. My guess is that the reason Ukrainians are so are the focus of so much obsessive of thinking on the part of Russians has to do with the fact that given the constructions of Russian identity, the constructions that exist in Russia, Ukraine, by definition, not by volition, but by definition, challenges the existence and the identity of Russians in Russia. Um, again, it doesn't do so in reality. I mean, Ukrainians are where they are and the Russians are where they are. But given the pathological nation, nature of Russian constructions of their own reality, uh, the mere existence of Ukraine as a separate nation, the mere existence of Ukraine as a potential uh, other uh, creates apoplexy on the part of Russians because precisely because if Ukrainians exist, then Russian history, Russian identity is truncated. Uh, it can't be traced back to Kiev and who uh, at best it's traced back to the 13th or 14th century into the areas around Moscow. That means that Russian identity is shaped rather more less so by Byzantine culture, Byzantine religion, and East European religion, culture, and language, but more so by the Mongols, quite frankly. This transforms Russians into a very different kind of nation, 
one that they are obviously uncomfortable with. Um, and rather than employing what would be the obvious strategy, if you want to join Europe, become more European. No, their approach is to deny the existence of Russia, of Ukrainians, and if possible, to eliminate them altogether. That way they can resuscitate the narrative that's come under attack by Ukraine's very existence. This is bad news for everybody because it means that the problem goes deeper than Putin, goes deeper than his regime. As important as those two are in doing what Russia has been doing to Ukraine over the last two years, but uh, there is a deeper foundation to this. And my fear is that unless Russia is taught a lesson, so to speak, unless it really loses this war, um, there will be very little shift in the political culture. And in other, which, which is another way of saying that these sorts of genocides, wars, aggressions toward Ukraine, first and foremost, but toward everybody else as well, will remain possible, maybe not inevitable, but certainly possible. Soviet Union, as it was constituted, was a dictatorship. And of course, the Communist Party uh, ruled the country and eliminated all opposition. It controlled all of the uh, communication and media and uh, the uh, discourse in the country itself um, and, um, and uh, in Ukraine. So there was no free media in the Soviet Union. Um, it was all controlled uh, through the Communist Party and they printed what they wanted to print and uh, suppressed those voices that uh, tried to um, inform the world about the Holodomor. Now there were uh, Western journalists who were in the Soviet Union in the 1930s. And it turns out that um, we now know that uh, uh, they they um, were quite aware of what was going on. And um, one or two brave souls among them, um, Gareth Jones in particular, and also um, Malcolm Muggeridge, wrote about the famine and the terrible uh, loss of life that they had uh, witnessed. But... Um, this was largely ignored in the West. And this tells us, I think, a story about how some of our governments and how some of our um, institutions that are supposed to protect um, liberty and freedom of speech and um, human rights, uh, how they failed um, to do so. And we can draw lessons from that and bring that to understanding what's taking place today. Of course, things are much, much different in the sense that uh, we, we know quite well what's going on in Ukraine right now. Whereas in the 1930s, we, um, you know, um, one, could, one could argue that you know, some people didn't believe what was taking place or they were they were given misinformation by journalists, such as Walter Durant, the most famous case. So um, one could perhaps excuse some, some people in the West for not um, paying attention to, the Soviet, to what was happening in the Soviet Union, um, and in particular in Ukraine. But um, today, there's just so much information available and we know what's going on. And yet we're seeing again the possibility of a um, failure on the part of the uh, Western governments, the governments that we um, know are the most democratic and um, that um, you know claim that they are standing up for human rights. They are all signatories to the Genocide Convention. Um, they all um, are members of the United Nations. We have a 
alliance called NATO. There are um, there is the G seven, and yet we're seeing this you know um, go slow, drip by drip approach to helping Ukraine in the fight against Russian aggression. So we have to ask ourselves the question, you know, um, why is this taking place? Why isn't the why isn't the um, understanding, knowing what we know now, um, why isn't the resistance to Russian aggression firmer? I'll leave my comments there. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would just add that uh, while today there are, are journalists in Ukraine, people have phones, they're filming things, Propaganda is as is even maybe more intense now than it could have been during the whole of the war. Yes, the Western countries know and are fully aware, and it's still, as Book Don said, drip, drip. But there are many other countries that are seizing on anti-Ukrainian narratives propped up by the Kremlin. Um, and I think there's a similar similarity with the whole of the war that. Uh, the way propaganda works, I don't think it's always intended to convince. It's enough to leave people shrugging their shoulders saying, oh, multiple stories, we can't really know the truth. We can remain passive. And sometimes people find it a, a convenient out not to act. Maybe they cynically know better and say, well, the Ukrainians say this and Russia says this. Uh, but uh, it, major American conservative political figures are repeating Russian propaganda points about Ukraine right now. Uh, it it it's you know you you can maybe it's better not to get on Twitter, but it 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 it's really awful that as much as there is information, it's hard for many people to sort between the 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 uh, information and the disinformation, and then there's been a whole effort to discredit. You know what do they call it? Mainstream um, uh, legacy media, and I think there is a whole a portion of the population uh, that believes the propaganda and and uh, allows politicians then to to not act. Uh, I want to mention other one other journalist. Bogdan mentioned journalists that did report on the whole of the war. That there was the brave Gareth Jones. There was Malcolm Muggeridge. There was also a Canadian journalist named Ria Kleiman, who may in fact have been the first uh, Moscow-based correspondent who traveled to Ukraine, witnessed with her own eyes, and would write about the horrors of the whole of the war. It's a cautionary tale. If you had Googled her, I would say 10 years ago, nothing would come up, and you would think nothing was written about the whole of the war uh, prior to Gareth Jones and Malcolm Muggeridge, but it took a uh, Canadian academic, uh, Serhii Sipko and Yars Balan working in archives, looking at microfiche uh, to stumble on a now defunct newspaper. You know, these, if a newspaper goes out of business, it's not necessarily scanned and put online. And they found that this woman, Rhea Kleiman, did in fact write about the whole of the war, but she worked for a publication that was not nearly as influential as Walter Durrani in the New York Times. And uh, she's she was forgotten by history, but I, I think that um, now if you Google her, you'll find lots of information because of the, the work that certain people are doing. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. But no, it's also, well, uh, just a, two brief comments. Uh, one is, you, you know, we, we are all shocked in today's world by mass killings and genocides of humanity, they're actually the norm, <laughs> whether they were perpetrated by Alexander the Great or Julius Caesar or the Persians or Chinese or the Aztecs or the Incas or the Ottomans and so on down the, down the list. Um, and I think that has something to do with the unwillingness on the part of people in the 1930s as well as today to get too excited about another incident of mass violence. 
especially when, when you consider the bloodiness of World War I um, and the memory of World War I. Again, this is no justification for ignoring the Ukrainian famine. It's just an explanation of why governments and populations tend to be indifferent. The other point I wanted to make is that democratic governments, by and large, fear making big decisions. Uh, I mean, there are instances, of course, where when their back is against the wall, they will then lash out, and usually very successfully. But by virtue of the fact that they're democratic, that they're responsible, there's a division of power, there are always elections, there's media pressure. The last thing you want to do is to embark on a risky move that could possibly go wrong. Better to hope for better days. Uh, better to try to see if you can work things out by means of appeasement, negotiations, talking. We saw this in the 1930s with Hitler, and we see this again today with Putin. It's so manifestly clear to anybody that it's impossible to negotiate, as Golda Meir once put it, with someone who wants to kill you. <laughs> you couldn't do it in, the in 1938. But it was done in Munich, of course, and you certainly can't do it today. But it's being recommended left and right by people in North America, Europe, and throughout the world. Um, and one doesn't have to be a trained Sovietologist to know that pathological liars and uh, sociopaths like Putin are people who can't be trusted. You know, period, end of story. And yet, People insist that you should talk to them. And yet, as we know, there were lots of people in the West, as well as throughout the world, who thought of Herr Hitler as a reliable interlocutor. There you go. That's just the reality, I'm afraid. This seems almost a um, a secondary question of that's uh, considering everything that's going on right now. Um, the uh, um, revocation of the award would be symbolically important, of course. It would be a statement, um, and God knows we need um, statements like that. Um, we need to show some backbone. We need to show some um, fortitude and willingness to confront um, aggression, indeed evil in the world. Uh, one, Alexander raised a very good point about uh, the um, violence that uh, uh, is so uh, prevalent um, in world history we can call the 20th century a uh, century of genocide. I know myself that um, uh, in my own memory, um, I remember the Rwandan genocide. I remember the Bosnian genocide. So I, I've, I've witnessed two genocides um, uh, through television, of course, but um, um, I saw this going on with my own eyes on television. and. Um, these are just recognized genocides, but then there, were, then there are the ones that are still unrecognized. There is the genocide taking place right now against the Uyghur population in China. There is the genocide, one can argue, against the Tibetans. There's the, um, so there's, um, there have been cases of mass killings um, that, um, in Africa that have taken place recently. Um, we know in Ethiopia that there is um, famine is being used as a weapon against the Tigres, for instance. Um, so um, all of these cases of mass violence, the use of famine as a weapon um, is being used over and over and over again. And um, God knows we need to have... Uh, we need to show more, more, uh, more um, backbone. We need to stand up to um, these instances of uh, genocide and uh, 
instances of uh, mass killings and of oppression. Otherwise, uh, sooner or later, we're going to be we're going to have to face it ourselves. Thank you. Uh, it, it's an uphill battle. Uh, the The Pulitzer Committee has never revoked a prize. Uh, I've heard people say they have. People have returned their prize out of you know shame when it's been uncovered that there was plagiarism fraud, but they've never done it before. Of course, they don't want to open up Pandora's box of how many of the awards, if you looked, scratched a little bit deeper for one reason or another, have some questionable element to them uh and they fall behind that he was given the award for the year before the famine started not during it uh but nonetheless i mean the the pulitzer committee wouldn't have to uh necessarily uh recall it for the new york times to do something more dramatic to disassociate themselves from their from this reporter that was um awarded the Pulitzer as their representative in, in, in Moscow. Yeah. I would only underline the point that Bohdan made at the very beginning of his comments, namely that from today's perspective with an ongoing genocidal war in Ukraine, the Duranty issue really is on the back burner. It's secondary. Uh, it's important, of course, and I suppose one needs to continue emphasizing that he was a scoundrel and didn't deserve the prize. That said, um, you know, there's there are more important issues, and they relate to Ukraine's the survival, to its war, to its ability to win. Um, so, if I were, you know, making recommendations to the diaspora. I'd say, you know, put Durante on hold, focus on the war, or alternatively, if it's absolutely imperative that you focus on Durante, be sure to tie him in, in some fashion, to the reporting or the misinformation or the disinformation that is currently being spread by Russia and its useful idiots in the West. That way it becomes, then, you know, you still get to poke fun at Durante, but it, more importantly, you tie them into contemporary events. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I just add, that you, you know, there may be value in looking, reviewing the, the whole phenomenon of Walter Durante and how respected he was and how influential he was and it's a, why that matters today. Who are we listening to? And why was Walter Durante trusted despite the evidence there was that he was, uh, you, you know, you, 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 we don't know what was in his mind, but it seems from all accounts that he was, it was more important to him, his sinecure in Moscow, a comfortable mm -hmm. life, being an important person with access to top people in Moscow, that was more important to him than being a true journalist and speaking out and even potentially saving millions of lives if he'd uh, you know, raised the alarm soon enough. I mean, when you, th he wasn't, he didn't directly commit genocide, but when you think that the International Red Cross could offer the Soviet Union food aid and the, the Soviet Union could turn it down and say, no, thank you. We don't need food aid because there's no famine. That is possible in the context of Walter Durante's reporting that the, the Soviet Union couldn't, in, in the eyes of many, credibly turn down the, the offer of food from the International Red Cross. So, I mean, he, 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 you can make the case how directly he is responsible for the deaths of millions, really. So, it's it's not our priority now, but it it's not a minor issue. His culpability. One way to deal with this, for instance, is to compare him, in the manner that you've suggested, to this German author Horst Seipel, who apparently got four hundred thousand euros for a laudatory biography of Putin. Uh, there's Tucker Carlson at this in the United States, who is essentially arguably even more influential than Durante. Uh, 
um, and has presumably sold his soul to the devil. So that would be useful because you're talking about the whole demog, but at the same time, you're bringing in the Putin war against Ukraine. Well, um, we uh, keep on hearing um, a similar story being repeated over and over and over again, it seems. Um, the warning signs are there and um, the uh, our governments are institutions uh, fail to respond properly to the warning signs. Um, when um, Russia began to uh, become um, obviously more authoritarian under the Putin regime, um, the West, I think, ignored many of the signs that things were becoming worse and that a danger was um, appearing not only to um, people in Russia itself, because Putin, as we know, has crushed democratic rights within Russia proper, but um, to peoples, um, to the newly independent countries of the former Soviet Union, um, Ukraine, first of all, um, and now to the Western, now to the Western world, and arguably to the rest of the world, we had uh, the war in Chechnya was the first sign that um, uh, things were turning for the worse in Russia, and uh, we saw that the West basically turned a blind eye to this. Um, what I would argue was a genocidal war, uh, the war against Chechnya. And Putin uh, also, um, the Russian leadership um, started that war under the pretext of apartment bombings. And it was clear uh, from very early on that these apartment bombings were actually um, uh, done by the FSB in order to uh, rile up um, Russian public opinion and to get support for Russian opinion to launch this war against Chechnya. So we had the war against Chechnya. Uh, then we had the Georgian war. We had other um, public statements made by Putin that were troubling. Uh, then we had the 2004 um, Orange Revolution, the attempt to, um, uh, by by the uh, Russian government to um, uh, take over Ukraine through the false elections in 2004, um, th through their proxy Yanukovych. Uh, then we had uh, the Georgian um, invasion. And uh, then we had 2014. And... Um, the response of the um, uh, world was, um, I think, um, not adequate, very inadequate. And it's, again, a failure. It's not the same type of failure as in 1938, but it's a similar type of a failure. Thank you. Hey, Mark. Well, obviously, I agree with everything Bogdan said, but I, I will also add, I was naive uh, when R Russia invaded, annexed Crimea. I expected the world response at that time to impose such sanctions uh, that Russia would, uh, it would, it would hurt in such a way that they would never dare what they've done today. At the time, there was a slap on the wrist. And I think wishful thinking that, okay, this is, it's not nice what Russia did, but you have to understand that, that their deep feelings about Crimea, they'll be satisfied with this. Well, uh, we, we see where that led. Um, 
I'm, I'm, I've lost track of the question. How is it possible? I, well, and I think, well, Alexander will say more, but I, 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 I think he's exactly right that there's a certain slowness and it, it's hard to make very big decisions. So there's a certain amount of wishful thinking. Well, maybe if he gets Crimea, he'll finally be satisfied. Um, let's face it, the world's afraid of Russia. There's always this a talk of fear of escalation and uh, nuclear weapons are always part of the context in these discussions. Uh, and I, I don't know. I'm, I'm interested in what, what Al, this is really a, a interesting question for a, a professional in the field. I'm, I'm looking forward to what Alexander will say. Thank you. I'm going to disappoint you, I'm afraid. But, oh. <laughs> uh, well, I think the mistake we made, we as a as a, sort of the the uh, Russian studies, Ukrainian studies community, and it's certainly a mistake I made. So I take full responsibility for everything I say here. Uh, was to assume that Putin's rationality was similar to ours. Um, or if you like, one could say that he's irrational and we are, but whatever the case, I mean, however you want to term this, uh, he has a different approach. And one might want to call it ideological, one might want to call it rooted in political culture, uh, but it has a different set of priorities and a different set of values and a different set of motivations and goals. From a strictly rational point of view of the kind that we would tend to endorse, makes no sense whatsoever to have started the war against Ukraine in February of last year. Totally crazy, totally stupid. Um, and when you look at the consequences of the war, they were all foreseeable before the war actually began. There's no benefit to Russia uh, politically, culturally, historically, I mean, nothing. There is no benefit. One could make a similar case for the annexation and invasion of Crimea. I mean, effectively, Crimea was Russian anyway. Uh, why aggravate relations with Ukraine and the rest of the world, even though the rest of the world didn't respond all that vigorously? But why aggravate these relations? Why not just leave things as they were and let Yanukovych sell half the country to the Russians for a pittance? I mean, that would have been in the cards anyway. Um, so from a kind of rational point of view, it doesn't make any sense. Um, and I personally, I didn't expect the invasion of February to take place for all the reasons that I mentioned. It didn't make sense politically, diplomatically, internationally, economically, militarily, strategically, and if so on down the list. But it made sense to Putin because he wasn't driven by any of those considerations. His goal was to destroy Ukrainians. It's that simple. Uh, to destroy Ukraine and to destroy Ukrainians. Um, and it's a similar kind of rationale vis-a-vis -vis Hitler and Jews. Um, I mean, seriously, do you really need to destroy Jews because of some threat they pose to Germany, the largest and most vigorous and economically powerful country in Europe at that particular time? I mean, seriously? Of course not. And yet, that was the reason. I mean, for, as far as Hitler was concerned, they represented a mortal threat to the very existence of Germans. And I think it's the same with Putin. And not just Putin. Again, if it were just Putin, then, you know, there'd be a happy end sooner or later, because he would, of course, depart this world. But it's not just Putin. It's the Russian elites. And my impression from the polling data is that it's probably somewhere over 70, 80 percent of the Russian population who feels similarly. And we're back to where we started from in this discussion, or at least I'm back to where I'm started from, uh, namely that we have a deep seated problem here and it has to do with the cultural pathologies of the Russian nation and the ideological and cultural pathologies of the Russian leadership. Uh, and the only cure I can see would be the equivalent of a defeat as great as World War II was for the Nazis and the Germans. Whether that'll happen, this is the big question. Thank you. I'd like to add just one point. Um, if you look at the history of Russia through the last centuries, it's been an imperial power for so long. And although it suffered some military defeats, setbacks, 
that hasn't really been defeated decisively. Um, in World War I, it did suffer a defeat, but there was the Bolshevik Revolution that um, I would say um, uh, brought back the um, imperial impulse into uh, the Russian um, into the Russian state. So it never re it failed to. There was a turning point in Russian history, but it failed to turn. And so the um, in 1991 it happened again. The empire fell apart, but the um, imperial impulse was never really uh, destroyed. And Putin represented that imperial Im impulse again. Um, and, and he made his intentions clear at the very beginning. We're going to make Russia great again. We're going to, Russia won't be on its knees again. So these were already warning signs that were, or, or you know, statements that he made early, early on. And then when he launched the war in Chechnya, it was obvious, um, at least to me, that, uh, that, that he was bent on, on, uh, on uh, restoring um, the Russian Empire. Um, I didn't think that it would um, lead to this uh, terrible war at that time, but you know, um, uh, the danger signs were um, were there uh, um, very early on, and you know, the um, the imperial tradition is so strong in Russia, the feeling of Russians that they deserve the right to have an empire, they deserve the right to rule over others has been there for centuries. Maybe Alexander would want to take this up first. Let me start, from, I mean, I've already answered the question in my previous comments. I mean, Russia has to lose the war. Yeah. It's very simple, it has to lose the war. Does it have to fall apart? Does it have to become a pure democracy? Maybe yes, maybe no, uh, but it absolutely has to lose the war. If Russia doesn't lose the war, if it wins the war, then all of these impulses will continue. Uh, the uh, It won't be punished for anything because it will be a big power um, and it will continue committing these sorts of crimes. So in a word, Defeat is Russia's only salvation. I have nothing to add to that. I just agree completely with Alexander. Russia has to be suffer a sound defeat. And um, I, I think that's the only thing that can begin to bring the Russians to their senses. And also uh, will give the opportunity to, uh, to, uh, um, for them to uh, have their day of reckoning. <laughs> I have a question. Maybe Alexander knows. Maybe someone here knows. The 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 people who do call for Ukraine to negotiate, uh, to to know, as, as though giving away territory will uh, satisfy Putin not to come back for more later. Um, putting that aside, are they also saying once there's a negotiated settlement, there there are no war crimes investigations or. Uh, trials for the perpetrators if you've negotiated a settlement with them that's it you almost have to defeat them don't you in order to then put people on trial yes I mean, yes in a word yes i mean if if you, they're you, not defeated, then you negotiate then... your away the right to pursue justice later uh for the crimes effectively effectively it would be very hard to make the case that the co-signatory on a peace document, namely Putin or whoever, is a war criminal <laughs> after you've signed the same document with him. Another so reason. He's likely to get away with it.